all right what's up everybody um so today i kind of wanted to go over uh how i view markets um so i view myself as like a merchant or a trader so and like i mean that in the old sense of you know uh trading commerce so let's just say that i go from country to country and i'm buying goods and uh, let's just say goods and spices and I'm bringing it to a different country and I'm trying to sell it for a profit. So I'm buying in one country and selling in another and I want to get a decent margin between what I bought it for and what I sell it for when I travel back. So today we're going to be looking at a video on the Silk Road, uh, the Silk Road. So the Silk Road uh, and not the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency Silk Road, I mean the ancient Silk Road where um, merchants were bringing goods and like spices or dyes from China to the Middle East and Europe and vice versa. So let's jump into it. A banker in London sends the latest stock info to his colleagues in Hong Kong in less than a second. With a single click, a customer in New York orders electronics made in Beijing, transported across the ocean within days by cargo plane or container ship. The speed and volume at which goods and information move across the world today is unprecedented in history. But global exchange itself is older than we think, reaching back over 2,000 years along a 5,000-mile stretch known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road wasn't actually a single road, but a network of multiple routes that gradually emerged over centuries, connecting to various settlements and to each other, thread by thread. The first agricultural... Now, when we look at the Silk Road, this is pretty much how I view currencies and also crypto cryptocurrencies. So you have all these little things that are going on that you really don't see that are transacting when you're trading a cryptocurrency or you're sending somebody else crypto or if you're making an exchange when you're traveling to a different country so let's say i travel from the united states of america to canada and i have to exchange my usd to canadian dollars or let's say i have ethereum and you know god for, i hate the gas fees but let's say i want to transfer my ethereum into an nft or i want to transfer my ethereum into bitcoin or into uh wonderland or uh, Solana, there's always going to have to be that transaction fee. And all of all we're seeing is just a click of a button. But really what's going on is there's either like it depends on if it's proof of stake or if it's um, uh, like a mined cryptocurrency. So if it's a mined cryptocurrency, then there's going to have to be somebody who's doing that, who's I guess I'm trying to figure out the word to put it like authorizing that transaction. So anyways, there's just a lot of things that kind of go on behind the scenes when we're trading uh, different currencies or if we're trading goods and services on a global scale. And hopefully one day we go into an intergalactic scale where we're transferring, we're, trans, uh, we're transporting goods from, you know, galaxy to galaxy or a solar system to solar system. Connecting to various settlements and to each other, thread by thread. The first agricultural civilizations were isolated places in fertile river valleys their travel impeded by surrounding geography and fear of the unknown. But as they grew, they found that the arid deserts and steppes on their borders were inhabited not by the demons of folklore, but nomadic tribes on horseback. The Scythians who ranged from Hungary to Mongolia had come in contact with the civilizations of Greece, Egypt, India, and China. These encounters were often less than peaceful. But even through raids and warfare, as well as trade and protection of traveling merchants in exchange for tariffs, the nomads began to spread goods, ideas, and technologies between cultures with no direct contact. One of the most important strands of this growing web was the Persian Royal Road, completed by Darius I in the 5th century BCE. Stretching nearly 2,000 miles from the Tigris River to the Aegean Sea, its regular relay points allowed goods and messages to travel in nearly one-tenth the time it would take a single traveler. With Alexander the Great's conquest of Persia and expansion into Central Asia through capturing cities like Samarkand and establishing new ones like Alexandria as Shad, the network of Greek, Egyptian, Persian, and Indian culture and trade extended farther east than ever before, laying the foundations for a bridge between China and the West. 
This was realized in the 2nd century BCE when an ambassador named Shang Qian sent to negotiate with nomads in the West returned to the Han Emperor with tales of sophisticated civilizations, prosperous trade, and exotic goods beyond the Western borders. So when it kind of comes to this, this is kind of how I view um, like cryptocurrencies and the metaverse now. So you have a lot of people transferring um, from the old model of I view gold as being um, a store of value against inflation on a US dollar. For us now, people are kind of going towards crypto as being the store of value instead of gold as the store of value because really gold only technically has its worth based off what we give it. And then it has some type of, you know, uh, properties that we could actually use for like technology. I, I don't think semiconductors use this. I, I can't remember what commodity uh, or what um, type of technology is used with gold, but I think it was something. I can't remember. But anyways, <laughs> right now we're kind of leading into a new world and we're figuring out new things when it comes to things that we can trade. So there's cryptocurrency, NFTs, uh, DAOs, um, mining, proof of stake. Uh, there's a whole new world that we're trading. And that's pretty much what I view this this type of transaction. is. so this guy went into a new world that he had no idea about and found out that there was new civilizations that had new goods that they were able to trade. And for us, that's pretty much like crypto. So we're pretty much transferring into a new world where we can, you know, conduct trade. And you have like smart contracts or NFTs, which you can use to make normal contracts. So like lawyers, instead of having to write out a contract and put the paperwork somewhere and then having to look for it, you can do it as an NFT. And then you can easily use like SQL or our database and you can find that NFT super easily instead of you having to log everything physically on paper. So um, we will go too in depth, but we'll continue with the video. Ambassadors and merchants were sent towards Persia and India to trade silk and jade for horses and cotton, along with armies to secure their passage. Eastern and Western routes gradually linked together into an integrated system spanning Eurasia, enabling cultural and commercial exchange farther than ever before. Chinese goods made their way to Rome, causing an outflow of gold that led to a ban on silk, while Roman glassware was highly prized in China. Military expeditions in Central Asia also saw encounters between Chinese and Roman soldiers, possibly even transmitting crossbow technology to the Western world. Demand for exotic and foreign goods and the profits they brought kept the strands of the Silk Road intact, even as the Roman. So I kind of view this as like one of the first global economies. Now that back in their time, this was viewed as the global economy, you know, Asia, to the Middle East, to Europe, and then even Africa. This was like their global economy. So they had different currencies that they were using. Um, and I'm pretty sure maybe their main one was gold or maybe silver, which they could transact, they can make transaction with um, from continent to continent. And that's how we have to view things today is we're still having trade that's going on today from currency to currency. So euro to dollar or euro to Swiss or the one to the USD. And we're having trade. Um, it can be um, somebody buys some type of technology. We could say, for instance, Taiwan. Taiwan has... Um, is it's pretty much has like a um a monopoly on semiconductors so they pretty they like they pretty much control the semiconductor market um and what we can do is we in usd we can buy or from a company a company in the united states of america can buy semiconductors from taiwan but there's going to have to be that currency exchange that happens with that so Sometimes you want to buy a, uh, a, I'm not a cryptocurrency, but sometimes you want to buy a currency and hold it if you think it's undervalued. And then as it appreciates in value, you can buy more goods in that other country. Roman Empire disintegrated and Chinese dynasties rose and fell. 
Even Mongolian hordes, known for pillage and plunder, actively protected the trade routes rather than disrupting them. But along with commodities, these routes also enabled the movement of traditional. So these commodities are pretty much the same thing we trade now. So you have um, like gold futures, or you have coffee beans, you have um, soybeans. Uh, what else? Uh, lumber, uh, orange features. Uh, I they used to be chicken features, but I think they stopped trading chicken features like maybe in the 80s or 90s. Um, you have all these different commodities that are traded so that farmers and merchants can hedge their loss for potential risk. So let's say that there, uh, I think in Brazil, there was like a freeze over during their winter. And that made uh, coffee futures spike up in price because there was less, um, dem there was more demand for it than there was supply of coffee. So we still have that issue today and you can hedge that by trading commodity futures. Traditions, innovations, ideologies, and languages. Originating in India, Buddhism migrated to China and Japan to become the dominant religion there. Islam spread from the Arabian Peninsula into South Asia, blending with native beliefs and leading to new faiths like Sikhism. And gunpowder made its way from China to the Middle East, forging the futures of the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires. In a way, the Silk Road's success led to its own demise as new maritime technologies like the magnetic compass found their way to Europe, making long land routes obsolete. Meanwhile, the collapse of Mongol rule was followed by China's withdrawal from international trade. But even though the old routes and networks did not last, they had changed the world forever and there was no going back. Europeans seeking new maritime routes to the riches they knew awaited in East Asia led to the age of exploration and expansion into Africa and the Americas. Today, global interconnectedness shapes our lives like never before. Canadian shoppers buy t-shirts made in Bangladesh. Japanese audiences watch British television shows, and Tunisians use American software to launch a revolution. The impact of globalization on culture and economy is indisputable, but whatever its benefits and drawbacks, it is far from a new phenomenon. And though the mountains, deserts, and oceans that once separated us are now circumvented through supersonic vehicles, cross-continental communication cables, and signals beamed through space rather than caravans traveling for months, None of it would have been possible without the pioneering cultures whose efforts created the Silk Road, history's first World Wide Web. So that's why you can always learn from history and you can bring it into present day and then even lead it into the future. So that's why I was saying earlier, even though we started out with the Silk Road, we still have global trade that goes on today and how we can predict it, how we can predict where it will lead in the future is there's still going to have to be intergalactic trade that goes on. Maybe there's a, uh, a planet out there that has more natural resources than we have in, on Earth or on a different one like Mars or something like that. And you'll still have their Mars crypto, or they'll, it'll probably be cryptocurrency. So they'll have their Mars cryptocurrency. And since it's easier to transact crypto from like, rather than actual physical USD, then we can say, hey, look, we have this Mars crypto uh, and on Mars, we need more water. We need more fresh water for our planet so what we're going to do is we're going to just say alpha centauri so what we're going to do is we're going to send alpha centauri our mars cryptocurrency in exchange for their fresh water and there's going to have to be a spaceship that transports that fresh water and then that will end up that that route for that spaceship takes from alpha centauri to mars is going to be the new silk road so um and how i can can uh, transfer that to you through charts and trading is um oh, my mouse turned off there we go so when i'm trading on a chart i'm using a 200 period moving average and on trading view when we're merchants we're looking to purchase assets that can get, appreciate in value so how i do that is i use a 200 period moving average so this is tradingview.com it's a free software that you can use um uh to 
chart to do your technical analysis in markets. So I use this for currencies, crypto, futures, equities, bonds, all of, the, all of that stuff. I use this to chart, um, just makes it easier for me. I use different brokers, but anyways, so I use this 200 period moving average to get my bias or my sentiment and where the market direction is gonna go. So this is a daily chart on the Euro USD. This is a Forex currency pair. And how I mentioned earlier is as a trader or a merchant, I'm looking to purchase things that are going to appreciate in value over time. And then I want to sell it to somebody else for a profit. So what we're doing here is we're saying um, we're using this 200 period moving this 200 period moving average for our bias in the market. So all you have to do is go to tradingview.com, um, bring up the chart. You'll you'll you can go to daily, four hour weekly, whatever you uh, want to use. I'm just using a daily for this example. And what you want to do is come to the search and type in moving average. So it's going to be this one right here. And then what you'll do is you want to go to a little cog. It's going to be in the top left corner where my mouse is. You go and say uh, moving average. It'll say nine as yes, there's the, that's the default setting. And then you want to go to settings, go to inputs and type in 200. Now, a lot of trend traders use the 200 period moving average as a trend bias or a sentiment in the market to where other traders are going to also look for that market to go in that direction. Um, you can have more aggressive or more lenient uh, moving averages, but the 200 is pretty much um, industry standard. So what I'm going to do is go back in time and say that as a merchant, I believe that I can make transactions with the USD more effectively than with the Euro. So I want to buy USD and I want to sell the Euro. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use some basic technical analysis and we'll do another video with supply and demand and support and resistance to kind of go over that. But I view this as a decent price for where, um, I should buy more USD than Euro. So that price, we'll just go to the quarter. We'll just say um, 118.50. And what's going to happen is I'm going to put place a sell order right there. And I believe that as the merchant that I am, I can make better transactions from the dollar than the euro. So when price gets to 118.50, I'm going to look to sell this uh, currency. And I want to buy it back for a profit at a later date. So I'm shorting this currency, which means in Forex, um, there's Forex pairs. I'm selling Euro and I'm buying USD. So as you can see, the price comes into the level and it starts to sell off. Now, when you're a merchant, what you're looking to do is find trends or find products that people want to buy. So what I want to do is I want to find a product or, and then we'll just go to, um, something that people might be a little bit more familiar with. Um, let's see, you know, we'll go to tech and we'll go to AMD. So what I want to say is I believe that other merchants or other consumers want to buy AMD. And AMD does not have to be the company. It can be a commodity. It could be a service or something of value that people would want to buy or purchase. So as you can see, we're above this 200 period moving average. And what I want to do is I want to buy as long as we're above this 200 period moving average. And in doing that, I'm saying that I want to buy at a low price and I want to sell at a high price. So you're always going to hear traders that say, oh, like people who make money trading, like the generic answer is I buy low and I sell high but it's kind of hard to figure out like what's a low price and what's a high price. And you're always going to have that struggle because nobody knows what's actually the, the high price. Now you can use, um, um, like PE ratios and stuff like that. And say if the PE ratio is above a hundred, uh, a hundred, um, times earnings, then that's overpriced for me, but it can always continue to make new highs. So, but anyways, what we're doing is as a merchant, we're saying as long as people are willing to buy this commodity or this asset, we're going to look to buy with it. And we want to buy on the retracements, which some people will say buy the dip. 
um, and we want to sell once it goes to a higher price. So we can say we bought it at 80 and then we sold it at 100 or if we sold it at 120. But anyways, we'll just keep it basic for that day, guys. Uh, we'll keep it that basic for the day and we'll just move on to another video later on. So I hope I was able to help you guys out with pretty much figuring out that we are merchants when we're trading. We're trying to buy things for a cheaper price and sell it for a higher price later on. As a merchant, what we're trying to do is we're trying to buy things for a cheaper price and sell at a higher price. So what I'm using is that 200 period moving average to give me some type of sentiment on what the market wants. So if somebody wants to buy uh, AMD and I think that this is a good commodity or other people want to buy this, and we're above that 200 period moving average, then I'm saying I want to buy here and then at a later date, I want to sell at a higher price. And it's not always going to work, but it's giving us some type of um, measurement of what the market wants. And now if that was beneath the 200 period moving average, then people want to sell it for whatever reason. And we can let this sell it at a high price and, and then buy it back at a low price. And I know that might sound a little like crazy to say, I'm going to sell something when it's here that I don't own. And then I'm going to buy it back when it's cheaper. But I can kind of go over another video on that since this has already been a long video. But that's pretty much what we're doing. We're trying to find sentiment and things that the market wants. Do people want this product or do people believe that this is going to appreciate in value over a certain amount of time? So we're buying low, selling high, using that 200 pair moving average. All right, guys, that's it for today. So um, please like, comment, subscribe, turn on the post notification bell, share with a friend, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. Even Jesus had a shooter and God be having unbelievers. That didn't mess up their demeanor And yes, they know it's hard, they know oh, 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 uh. Cause when they be up in those trenches, man, they show up uh. But what they do is look for